We have 18 months to develop our so. Hello everyone. So it's with great pleasure and honor that I am welcoming Mr. Ulrich Orenfeld Anderson. Mr. Anderson is a seasoned maritime CEO and board member with a career spanning over the best part of two decades. He has served as the head of the Marsk VLGC pool at Marsk Tankers. He was a managing director for Neugas Shipping International and the head of shipping at Petrodeck PTE Limited. He was also the CEO of Avance Gas and subsequently served as the CEO of Golden Ocean Management, the world's largest owner of Cape Size vessels, which is also dual listed both on Oslo Stock Exchange and on NASDAQ. Now, what are you going to actually see in this interview? You're going to witness the entire professional journey of Mr. Anderson from graduating college back in 2002 to how shipping basically discovered him rather than him discovering shipping in the first place. You're going to understand how a senior leader is making decisions in a corporate setup, where he gravitates to tackle challenges, how he introduces sustainability, satisfaction both of clients and the workforce of the organization, and how he introduces much required growth in the organizations he has represented. I strongly believe that this is one of the most insightful interviews I have done up to this point. So I hope you can find the same value in this interview as, as I found when interviewing Mr. Anderson. Thank you and enjoy the interview. Hello, Mr. Anderson. I think I can Hi. hear you now. Hi, yes, good morning. Think... Good morning. How are you doing? I am good, thanks. And yourself? I am great. I'm great. Hope you're having a good summer. Yeah, well, uh, the weather could have been better, but uh, actually today it's uh, it's quite nice. So uh, maybe we get a little later uh, Indian summer up here in Norway. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I won't hold my breath. Let's see. But uh, but uh, but so far, so good. Oh, absolutely. Uh, first of all, Mr. Anderson, I want to thank you for doing this. Up until the moment that I saw your face, I was thinking, okay, maybe he's going to show up. Maybe he's not. Uh, it's not. I don't know. Very... When I say something, I do it. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, absolutely. But what I, what I mean is not a lot. Not a lot of CEOs have time to talk to like complete strangers, students from around the globe. I understand your schedule, so I have to state that I am very thankful. Yeah, no, uh, it's 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 uh it's always nice to uh, what can you say participate in the in those things that you that you can. And I think uh, now I'm actually leaving Gold Notion uh, officially. I'm out uh, at the end of the month, uh, but it was always mm -hmm. uh, can you say something that I would take out time to do uh, if I if I could uh, because um yeah you know I think it's nice to. Uh, to uh, to help uh, people uh, when you can and maybe also get the uh, name Golden Ocean out. Uh, that's not why I'm here now since I'm leaving. But uh, but I thought it was always good uh, to um, to 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 wave the flag when you when 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 you could find the time. So uh, so my pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, the, the reason why I'm doing this interview is basically to just spend a couple of seconds to explain to you what I'm doing. Is yes. because in the university we don't get this exposure. There is no way we're going to have somebody who is a senior leader come in the university and he will or she will talk to us about what they've done in the industry and how they strategized, how they made decisions along the way. Uh, so this is a way of helping myself to understand what it takes basically to survive in this area where you are and share this knowledge for free with also students. That's why I'm doing it. And to be honest, I was quite intrigued by your CV because you you have displayed a very very rapid rise, especially through Marx tankers. But we, we will go there. So wh where I want to start is you have basically you have very diverse experience. You have 20 years of experience 
within the media, beauty, the energy and shipping industry. So you've headed market leaders, the Advanced Gas, Golden Ocean, as you mentioned. So what I want to discuss is the period of your uh, studies. So 1999 to 2007, basically. Or, or for better uh, terms, 2005, because you then had your uh, BSc through the... I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the chartered sea brokers. So let, let's, okay. let, let's stop at 2005 then. So what I want you to, to talk about is your student vacancies, how they helped you to channel that, all that professionalism in the maritime sector, basically. And what was your vision when you graduated in 2005? Yeah, well, um, thanks for the, for the questions. And I think it's very uh, relevant discussion. Uh, I've also given uh, it quite a lot of thought, actually, myself, kind of, you know, how, you know, how did I end up where I, uh, where I ended? Um, and we've got to get into that, of course. Uh, but uh, just to begin, I'll say that there's a certain amount of luck and the uh, and uh, coincidence in, uh, in, 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 in that as well, and in a career in general, I think. But, uh, but no, uh, when I started uh, in, um, at Copenhagen Business School back in the day, uh, you know, I had a, had a vision that I wanted to go out and have a career, but I must say, uh, I had not, what can you say, a formalized vision that I, you know, I wanted to go into shipping, I wanted to go into pharmaceuticals, I, you know, I didn't really have uh, that, uh, can you say, laid out uh, uh, career path. Um, so my, uh, can you say, approach to, um, to, uh, to, to university and to, uh, to can say, preparing for career was very much to, yes, of course, take the, uh, the courses, the right topics, maybe try and have at least some kind of financial, uh, can you say, um, uh, input. I think that's very important. Uh, but other than, than that, then, you know, look outside at the extra uh, curriculum activities. I think it's extremely important that you do something else than just just being in school. Um, so uh, I was active in student politics. I was a tutor for the new uh, students that came in, and that, that was all about drinking. So it was nothing serious, but you know, it just you know, it gives you a network. It makes you do stuff. Um, I also worked in a supermarket. I worked, uh, you know, so nothing fancy. But what can you say? I did a lot of stuff, and and the, you know the more years that I had uh, under the belt at the business school, the better jobs I could also get, the better student jobs I could also get. And I think that has really helped me. Uh, what can you say? Moving out of uh, uh, you know moving out into the real world. And I will say this as as a CEO today, when I look at people's CV, it's more important for me uh, not that they are in the top five or the top ten grade wise. But what they have done, uh, can you say, uh, on top of that? Um, so I think to go out and learn something about other things than just your school, and I'm not saying you know skip that all together, but to mm -hmm. to show that you can function in a you know in a real job, no matter almost what it is, you can get up in the morning, you can uh, you know you can do your duties. I think that sense a very strong, and you can function in a team, whatever team that may be, if it's a supermarket or. Or if it's a you know startup company, uh, you know, just that you can function somewhere else outside school. So these were some of the things that I had uh, had in mind. So it was more like making a broad approach to can you say uh, life after school, um, and then of course also remember to have fun on the way uh, in school because uh, <laughs> yeah, once you're out, uh, the real world quickly hits as well. So uh, so don't don't forget that either. Oh, believe me, I, I am in the process of moving out of school and into the real world, the professional world. It just hit me. <laughs> so it, it couldn't be more relevant what you're saying. Uh, yeah, one question I, I mean, up... it's not that bad getting out of school, but uh, <laughs> it will never come back that time. And, uh, nope. and uh, you know, I, I think back of uh, my days at the university with, uh, with a lot of uh, good memories. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, yeah. that's important to remember as well. Things should be, uh, should be fun along the way. Oh, yes. One question that comes out of what you said is, is diversity of skill appreciated in the industries you've seen throughout the years of your experience? Or is the, the element of being focused in a single capacity appreciated more than diversity of skill? It's a good question. And I think it depends is the, is the answer. Um, and there are pros and cons by both. I think eventually you need to find something you're really good at. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. So I think that... Um, what can you say uh, that eventually you will narrow your can you say your focus or your your competences around something uh, 
Uh, but I think it's important in the beginning to keep that, can you say, as open as possible, unless you just know, you know, I only want to work with this, this, and this. Okay, fine. I didn't, some will. But generally speaking, I'll say keep your options open by having as, as wide a selection uh, as possible. And I'll give you an example. So, as you said, I worked in the beauty industry, which mm -hmm. is a bit uh, maybe uh, counterintuitive when you see me working in a very, what can you say, uh, different industry today. Uh, and that was very random. So I was uh, I was um, interning at the Danish embassy in uh, Washington. I came back from that. It was between my bachelor and my master's. And when I came back to start my master's, there was a case competition uh, in the first week to kind of get the students to come together. And my group happened to uh, win that case competition. And it was a case competition uh, made by L'Oreal. And L'Oreal had some representatives who had like selected the winners. And then they asked me afterwards if I wanted to have an internship because they had seen our presentation, completely random. And I was like, L'Oreal, I mean, I'm a McKinsey guy, you know, I'm not gonna work in L'Oreal. Uh, but then it was like, I needed a job. And then I started out there three months and I got, I got, I got actually hired uh, permanently. So I worked there for two years. Now, what I found out was that, you know, I was on, I was not on the right shelf. So I worked out there, I worked hard, but it didn't really, you know, it didn't really feel like the right thing. And there I got the best advice I think, uh, you know, I, I, I ever had. My boss said to me, he said, Ulrich, we are not going to hire you full time in L'Oreal. And I was like, what? I mean, I worked here for two years and, you know, I'm graduating. This is what I really want because all I could see was, you know, working there. I didn't have like the, can you say the, the full perspective? He said, no, mm -hmm. you know, you and me, we cannot sit and discuss the color of a commercial that we're going to have in the next magazine. This, you know, it's not you. And every time I always picked the wrong colors and I couldn't see it, I was not that creative. So he said to me, Ulrich, you need to go work somewhere else. And uh, at that time I was like very devastated and I was very disappointed. Uh, but it was actually the best advice I could ever have gotten because I went in and applied with some of the companies that he said I would be much better suited at working for, one of them being Maersk, AP Marlin. Um, but nonetheless, I worked there two years uh, and I learned so, um, I actually learned quite a lot working there that I even to this day still use because they uh, have this fast moving consumer, or they are in the fast moving consumer goods and they see the world very, very differently than we do in, in shipping. So I learned from that. I learned things, but I also learned that I didn't want, you know, to work and I was not suited to work in marketing and the fast moving consumer goods. So it is a fantastic, uh, what can you say, experience. And I, I could have potentially started out going straight into marketing and I would have been at the wrong shelf from the get go. So I think it's a way of also testing out, you know, what is what, because we have an idea when we sit in business school, what is you know, how is it to work in tech? How is it to work in pharmaceutical? How is it to work in marketing? Whatever. Whereas in the real world, maybe it is, it is different. So, so I thought for me, at least, that that, that was a really, really good, um, can you say, uh, experience, let alone that, yeah, as I say, I learned a lot. So, so, so for me, that was uh, the point of trying to keep as many uh, avenues open as, 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 as possible. And then, of course, when I then insert into shipping, you know, you, you start narrowing, right? Okay, you have selected a, a, a line of industry. It doesn't mean you can't move, but after a certain amount of years, you know, you get more and more specialized. And today, I I, 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 I mean, there are adjacent industries that I could work in, uh, but I think it is very unlikely that I will take a big leap out of, uh, you know, far away from the ship. Um, so, so in that sense, I guess you 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 start wide, then you then you specialize, and then in a way, when you become a CEO, you, you kind of widen out again, but. Mm -hmm. It's a way, maybe a different, uh, different discussion. Would you say that what happened in L'Oreal is a sign of a high performance team? And what I mean by that is your manager basically applied constructive criticism. Maybe you could say destructive criticism, depends on the perspective, and told you basically, listen, I can see your capacities. You're not a good fit. It doesn't mean that I, I, am, I want to be mean to you. It means I am pragmatic towards you. And you said this is, this is the best thing that happened to you. But let's say you were working for a lower functioning team and they didn't care as much about growth and they kept you regardless. So would you say that it matters being in a high performance team that wants the best fit for the role so that you actually know if you're a good fit or not? I'm not sure hundred percent understand the question. Uh, can you try and rephrase? Yes. Yeah, of course, of course. What I mean basically is that you were in L'Oreal and your manager told you that I don't see you being a good fit for moving forward. So I think it's a good idea for you to go elsewhere and look for, some, for something else. 
if it was a lower functioning team, maybe your manager would tell you, yes, you're, you're a good fit regardless. I mean, maybe we don't have a larger pool of people to choose from, so we will keep you regardless. What was basically the sign of your manager telling you, oh, I can see that you have to, to leave, look for something else? I, I can see what he could see, could see back then. I couldn't see it myself at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was absolutely right. And I uh, wrote him a couple of years ago on LinkedIn, actually, to say thank you for that. And we had a good, uh, a good discussion, um, no, conversation. Um, but I think probably the reason why he could do it, as you say, uh, is that they have, they have a long, long line of people wanting to get into, into L'Oreal to work as a product manager. It was never a problem to find a good high performing people also much higher performing people than i would have been so it was the you know so it made sense but of course you're right if you are in a company where they are screaming for uh, you know employees and uh, maybe don't have a long line of people outside the door uh, they would probably just have pushed me into a, into some uh, into some role so so in that in that sense that was a uh, that was uh, that was that was lucky uh, that uh, that i got the can you say the push in the in the right direction mm -hmm. So let's now move on to uh, shipping, like totally different industry. So October 2005, when you went to Marsk uh, Tankers. So what I saw, and it, it hit me because it's quite impressive, is that you rose as the head of the VLGC pool from entering as a commercial graduate with Marsk within the span of like less than 24 months. So I want you to talk to me about that rapid rise within the company, basically, and which are the qualities that enable you to so quickly rise? being the head of the VLGC pool? Yeah, it was, it was pretty fast. I would say um, there are probably three reasons for, for, for that. I would say the first is the company culture. So you got to work in a company that uh, does not look at uh, how long you have worked there, but actually look at, uh, can you say, your credentials and what you're doing. You got to have that, uh, you got to have that culture immersed. Uh, at least back then, I don't know today, it's a little bit different company today, but, but back then it was very much uh, like that. They took a lot of young people in, gave them responsibility in a very young age. Uh, and um, what can you say? So, so they were not afraid to, can you say, let people run with responsibility. So I think company culture was definitely playing a big, uh, big role. Then, of course, I would like to think that I've done something right. Uh, you know, I tried to work hard and do the best that I could. And I could really also feel that coming from L'Oreal, working suddenly on commercial shipping, you know, I was much more on the right, right shelf. So I felt that also, right? Um, and then there was a third reason, which is always a reason, and that is a coincidence, or we can call it luck. We can call it what we like, be at the right place at the right time. Uh, all careers will have an element of that. You've got to have that, you know, luck. And what happened in, happened to happen in Merck was that some of the people above me got poached to other jobs. And suddenly there was a, there was a pathway uh, for me. And uh, when the culture is right and when you have been doing a reasonable job, they would point at you and say, okay, young man, it's your chance. So a combination of, uh, of these things, uh, I would say, the, as the main, as the, as the main, uh, main reasons. Were you prepared for these senior roles, though, at the moment where you were chosen? I don't think you're ever prepared. If you were prepared, you should already be in that role. Uh, you know what I mean? So <laughs> that was, yes. So you will never be prepared. And I think this is an extremely good, uh, can you say, uh, mentality that, uh, that I learned in Maersk and that I always bring with myself when I hire as well. I would never want to hire a person who can do everything in his role from day one. I would always hire someone who can only do 25, 30, 40%, 50% maybe, but never everything. Why? Because you want that person to go into the role full of energy, full of, uh, what can you say, uh, motivation, and to grow. Because then that person will stay in that role for two, three, four years, learning a lot. And then I would always say, okay, you have matured. You, we, are, you know, we are ready to push you on to the next job. Um, and I think it, that that was the mentality here. Okay, swim or drown. If you swim, okay, fine. You know, you 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 get to stay there. Maybe you go further on. Um, and that's the, that was the mentality in uh, in in Maersk. And I think it's a it's a brilliant mentality. And it's a little bit back to the what I talked about about the company culture. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of hiring like for like all the time, you take someone who is 
as I would say, a little bit hungry. Uh, and I think that will give, give better uh, better results. But 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 not all companies arguably will think uh, will think like this. So for me, a qualified candidate is not the guy who knows everything. It's the guy who knows fifty percent, sixty percent, thirty percent, whatever, depending on the role and the and the person. So you want basically from somebody capacity to learn. You want them to know like something, but like have huge capacity to learn. Because if you have a ceiling, especially as somebody who doesn't know a lot, then you're not coachable. Am I right? Yes. And you know, when I think back to uh, when I was a student, I thought, okay, to give you an example, I thought the CEO in a company, oh my God, he must be the one who is the best at everything. You know, he must be so good. And I'll let you in on a secret. That's not the case. CEO of Gold Notion, we are the, one of the largest uh, listed uh, uh, dry bulk owners in the world. Market cap, uh, well, it had uh, taken a little hit there, but it was pushing uh, two and a half billion uh, not too long ago, uh, US dollars, many people. The thing is that there's probably not one single person in the company that I could substitute and do a better job. You know, I'm not a CFO. You know? I'm not the best at uh, doing legal stuff. I'm not the best at uh, you know doing post-fixture operations. I'm not the best at the, at trading the the ships necessarily, particularly since I came from from LPG into uh, dry cargo. Um, so instead, you sit with a much more, can you say, uh, coordinating uh, role where you need to think uh, in the big picture, where you need to make sure that you remove all the obstacles for your employees, make it as simple as possible, the structures, everything, so they can do their job. And then you as CEO will be the cheerleader for the share price, speak to the capital market, speak to the board, uh, lay a strategy, have a vision, try and rally people around that vision and so on and so forth. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make uh, from your initial question is that sometimes we have a lot of respect for the level above us. We think, oh my God, this is very difficult. I mean, how, you know, but you know what? If you have gone through school, if you have gone through the job before, if you have, uh, you know, uh, medium intelligence you will learn and you have the right answer you will learn so i don't i think there's a lot of people that are sometimes afraid to take the next step or you know worried or you know they want everything to be perfect and if not then they you know and i think we forget about that you know just go ahead do it uh, you've come where you are in life you have a for crying out loud you have a, a degree you know you you are clever it, it's already we already know that so then it's about attitude and it's about motivation. And I think that's, uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's important to remember, have the right attitude. I mean, I'd rather have uh, the right attitude than, uh, than uh, someone who is uh, so highly intelligent that he can't function anywhere. Right. Uh, so, so think about that. So, so, so taking the next, uh, when, when you look at my CV, you say, Oh, you, you moved up so fast. Yeah. And when I look back, I can see, yeah, I, I, I had some breaks at the right time. But I never, I never really thought about it. I just went with the flow. And you know what? It's not the rocket, you know, it's not rocket science, you know? Most of it is not rocket <laughs> science. And, uh, and, um, and I think that's, a, that's, that, that's, a lear that's something I would have liked to, to know when, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was younger. Uh, and at the end, as I always say, at the end of the day, you know, it's just a job, you know? I think the important thing in your life, it's not your job. That's your family, it's your boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, mom and dad, whatever, whatever. Uh, it is just a job. Uh, so so I think that that has always been my attitude towards, uh, well, I had learned that attitude, I would say, a along the years. And I think that's, um, that's uh, you know, that, that if you think about it, you just walk into the, you know, it can be a little bit of a game, like, okay, this is your work. Here I am. I do what I need to do. And here's my private life. This is what matters at the end of the day. Then if you have a, something that's not working out for you, it could be a bit more like, yeah, okay, it's not the end of the world. It's just your job. Mm -hmm. uh, and that maybe makes you more likely to take some risks and be a little bit more brave, perhaps. I, I don't know. That's my own, uh, maybe, uh, maybe it doesn't make any sense at all, but that's, that's kind of how I, I, I try to think about it. Mr. Anderson, I think it makes perfect sense from somebody who has way less experience than you have and in very more minor capacities than you have had. Um, what I hold, I will hold on to is attitude. You mentioned love for your, for, from your family. That's why I'm doing these interviews at the end of the day, because somebody like you has 
done everything, go in a full circle, come around, and what are you saying now? That family matters. You're not sitting there saying job matters. Go after your job until you die. You say family matters. Okay, so for a young guy like me, or any young person that's watching this interview, invest in your family life early on so that you don't have to basically hit up on a brick wall when you're like, let's say 55. Not, not that you've had, but some people have out there. And then realize that, okay, all, all this time, what I always wanted was basically a good family balance and I don't have it. I, I would say that uh, don't forget that part of it. I mean, I'm not saying that job is not important because it is important. Mm -hmm. Of course. And, and what can you say? Uh, it's a uh, it's a big part of your identity. I mean, this this we all know. Uh, and 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 I have another uh, can you say thinking is that okay if I have to spend eight hours no matter what, working in some capacity, I may as well you know have a bit of fun while I do it and make as much money as possible. Uh, <laughs> let's not be stupid about that. But at the end of the day, we have to remember. You know what? What are the what are the real real, uh, real values? I, I I lost my father sadly uh, to cancer uh, one and a half year ago, and uh, right before he died, I spoke to him about life and about what you know you know if there's anything he would have done differently and, and, and a good good conversation. Uh, so he knew he was dying, and I tell you one thing he didn't say uh, he didn't say, and that was I wish I had worked more. So that that was not one of the things. Yes. So you can say, uh, you know, that 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 put also can you say my own uh, life into uh, into into perspective. So so I think having a good balance between the two because you know both are important. It's not that, but but at the end of the day, you know, just don't take it too seriously. The whole thing about the uh, about the uh, about work life and 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 maybe it's easy to me for me to say, okay, I said a CEO, but 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 I, I've just seen that having that. Okay, can you say? more relaxed attitude to the whole thing uh, can help you, uh, I think, also maybe even perform better at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Consider also my sincerest condolences for your father. Thank you. I'm sure he would be extremely proud of you, even though I know you for 20 minutes, but I'm sure he, he would. So if we continue your, your journey, basically, you previously mentioned that you were in the LPG sector and you displayed a great interest in the LPG uh, sector. So you moved to a uh, new gas shipping international and then Petrodeck, uh, PT, LTD. And the gas market in 2023 is hot, but it's been, as you know, this better than I do, very volatile, especially after uh, the incident with Ukraine in February of 2022. What I want to ask is basically, what drew you into the gas sector specifically? Is it something that naturally happened after Marsk tankers? Or is it something that you focused on for specific reasons? No, it was not. I mean, it was coincidence uh, again. Um, and uh, what can you say? Shipping is very much an, an asset play at the end of the day. Uh, and there are different commodities. Uh, but you can say, uh, what is the, the vessel are transporting themselves may not necessarily be that important for uh, the people working on shore and in, in can you say in uh, in uh, commercial roles or or, or uh, in, in financial roles. Um, when I started in Maersk, I should say uh, it was on a commercial graduate program. So they took in I think it was six guys and girls from Copenhagen Business School to to, to do a two year rotation in the in the in the in the company like kind of training us and that's where I did that uh, bachelor in shipping as well. Um, uh, but there I got allocated to LPG. So already back then there I was working with the, the VLDCs are carrying LPG. Uh, so, and that was completely random. One of my friends that I still uh, speak to, uh, who, who I met at that graduate program, he was allocated to LNG, which is a natural gas. And he's still a natural gas and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking uh, to him fairly often. <laughs> it could have been, you know, it could have been the other way around, I'm sure. So that was that was strictly random. Uh, to be honest, when I started in Maersk, I didn't even really know that there were differences between ships. You know, it was like, oh, I just wanted to work in Maersk because it was a big <laughs> company and they had a graduate program. And my mom was really proud because it was the biggest company in Denmark. And um, so that was that was very random. Uh, but um, but what can you say? Uh, when I went into new gas shipping, it was another can you say of these uh, being at the right place at the right time because I was head of the of the pool of of ships which is uh, several owners have taken their ships and put them in with with MERS and I was commercially responsible for these ships that they were you know the contract were negotiated and that they you know they were trading in the right uh, fixed contracts or spot contracts in the right 
right, the regions of the world to make as much money as possible. The point is that I knew a lot about the market and about the, can you say, the, the yeah, I was getting a little bit specialized here as we talked about earlier. So when I got, then I got offered the job to take over as managing director for a small, a much smaller company, uh, but privately uh, owned. So I was going from being a little fish in a, in a big pond to become a big uh, fish in a smaller pond. Uh, and that was, of course, I was only 31, I think at the time, maybe 32, uh, when I was offered to, can you say, become managing director and starting up this company because the guy who owned the ships had placed them in a pool with someone else. He wanted to take these ships back, make me the managing director and build up this organization around these. It was only six ships. Um, and that was very, very lucky that I got that uh, break. I remember I was uh, interviewing and I happened, the industry was very small, so I happened to uh, find out who the other candidate was. I was also told later. And he was 55, I think, at the time. <laughs> and I was 32. So it was very, uh, what can you say, uh, uneven uh, experience-wise. But there, I think the owner, uh, uh, whom I still actually speak to, he was an elderly gentleman. I think he liked the attitude and the can you say the young uh, the young motivation and drive and maybe thinking a bit like I do myself okay this guy doesn't know everything but he really wants to do this um and uh, yeah so I got that break but it was very very lucky that all the stars were, were aligned and I think there's one thing I would like to say uh, because you gotta have the luck uh, for sure no doubt about it uh, but I think one thing that I have done uh, I don't know if it's differently, but at least which has been a driving factor in, uh, in, in my career is that I have moved and for the positions. So I'm called up, asked if I can be managing director in this company or I want to interview for it. They say, you get the job. I say, okay, that's fine. And two months later, I'm, I'm living in Hamburg, right? I moved from Copenhagen. All right, everything. Okay, I'm gone. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the same that happened when I got to, I went to London after Hamburg. I was seven years with uh, with New Girls, or maybe eight, seven or eight years. And then I got an opportunity to move on. And then suddenly I got an opportunity to go to Advanced Gas in Oslo. Okay, I moved. I packed my bags. It was easy in the beginning when I had uh, no children uh, and uh, only a girlfriend. When that girlfriend later became wife and that one child came and another child came, it becomes more and more difficult to make these moves. Um, but I, I did it every time. And I think that that is really key here. So you got to be there. Of course, uh, you got to have a certain amount of uh, talent for what you're doing. Um, uh, and then you got to be ready to say, OK, I, I, I go for this uh, because it is not a it's not fun to move from another country away from your friends and whatever. Uh, and it's also not fun to start in a new job. Let's be honest. I mean, I've done it a lot and I still don't really like it. I mean, the first three months is horrible, right? You don't know where the bathroom is. You don't know anything. You don't know what you're supposed to do almost. Um, but you got to do it. Uh, so I think that's probably an important factor in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in that, not being afraid of changing jobs and, and going, for, uh, going for the next position. It is more comfortable to just sit, you know, where you are. It's easier. Um, but forcing yourself out uh, when you get the chance uh, is, is, is probably has probably been key in, 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 in why I'm here today more than so much else. Uh, really, that's probably one of the biggest factors really, now that I think about it. And adding to these challenges also when you, you mentioned the Vans gas, so when you moved in 2019, the company basically, the, 2019 was the year the company completed the, its integration into the Sea Tankers Group. And thus continued their long, basically, tradition of pursuing low-cost leadership. How did this uh, interact with your duties? Did it affect them? Did it enhance your leadership ability? I basically came in to Avance as new CEO because the company was moved in under the John Fredrickson system. It was because of it. Okay. Yeah, because they wanted to change the, can you say, as you say, they have a different way of viewing the world. And uh, the former CEO, uh, whom I know, uh, actually uh, of Avance Gas, whom I know, and has a very, uh, uh, very good, uh, good guy who could easily have continued as CEO, uh, he just was a different personality that didn't fit into, can you say, that system. Uh, and therefore, they agreed that, okay, this is not going to work, which is completely fair. Um, and that's, that was kind of the trigger for them to bring in a new guy. 
so you can say the integration into the sea tanker system was already halfway on the way. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, I carried that through. That was uh, that was probably the the the, the smallest thing uh, for me at the time. Uh, I think the biggest thing was that I was coming from a a senior position, yes, in shipping, uh, but very commercial, meaning that uh, it didn't deal so much with the financial side of the business. So coming from what can you say, a high commercial level, up into a CEO in a stock listed company, mind you. Uh, opens up a complete, uh, can you say, new world of, of tasks that we need to relate to. Uh, and I think that was the biggest challenge at that time. I mean, I started there and two months, I think it was not even two months, maybe it was three weeks, we had our first quarterly reporting. I was scared as I don't know what, you know, I come in there and uh, just moved to Oslo. And yeah, by the way, we have quarterly reporting and all the anal equity analysts are calling you, asking you this, that and the other. And you are like dead scared, like, oh my God, what if I say something wrong and they write something in their report and the share price uh, moves and, <laughs> you know, everything was chaos for me in the beginning. So I think um, the whole integration into the sea tanker system was a, was a smaller thing uh, that happened relatively uh, smooth uh, and had, had to, to a large extent really already happened. It was more that I came in there and suddenly I had to understand the capital markets. I had to understand the financial uh, part of the business uh, much better. And I hadn't had finance since uh, business school, right? So there was a few things that needed the dusting off there for sure. Um, but again, back to what I said earlier. Okay, you know, I'm not Einstein, but, uh, you know, I've done a, I have a degree. So, you know, I sit down, I speak to my CFO, I start working with it. You know, you start learning uh, the drivers. And in the first six months, it's all chaos. And then suddenly, you know, magically, the things start to fall into place. And now when I look back, at those past four years I've been CEO. Um, oh my God, I'm, I'm like in a completely different place. Like I, I, I know so much more and I think that is very satisfying. And that's what I want to encourage everyone to get out of their jobs, right? That they, you move, you're, you're out of your comfort zone. It takes six months, maybe it takes eight. And at times you're thinking, what the hell did I get myself into here? And then suddenly all the pieces fall into to place or a lot of them and you start calming down and you're like, wow, that's pretty cool. I can now do something I couldn't do before. I think that is the key that you grow all the time, if, 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 if possible. Uh, and and, and uh, yeah, so, you know, no one knows everything from the get-go. It, it's not possible. If you knew, then you should already, you know, be at that mentioned. level. Yes. Yeah. So, 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 so that's fine. I will say though, it was a, it was an early break becoming a CEO at that time. I mean, and, and, and for that, I'm, I'm grateful that I got the chance and the, can you say the, the the trust from the board and from from John John Fredrickson at the time, um, but uh, but uh, but but you learn. If, if 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 I can learn, you know, everyone can do it. <laughs> uh, Mr. Anderson, also I'm very much aware of the time, so I will ask one more question. I don't want to keep you any longer here. I asked th for thirty minutes. Uh, so you moved to Golden Ocean. So you stopped from Advance Gas in April 2020, and you moved to Golden Ocean at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, which didn't make, I presume, your transition that much smooth or easy within the company. It was a period of huge changes along the globe. So can you talk to me about your transition to Golden Ocean and your subsequent duties? Yeah, it was a very, I mean, so, so I was only in advanced gas for, I guess it was nine months. So it's important to understand that the main owner of advanced gas is uh, John Fredrickson, who is uh, the biggest ship owner in the, in the world. Uh, he owns a lot of uh, shipping companies and other companies outside shipping. So he owns Avance Gas and he also owns Gold Notion, which is a dry cargo. So two completely different commodities. Uh, and after nine months, the CEO of uh, Gold Notion, uh, she, uh, she left. And uh, I am called up uh, and completely, you know, to my own surprise, asked if I would be interested in going from Gold Notion uh, oh, sorry, from Advanced Gas to Gold Notion as the new CEO of, uh, of Gold Notion. And, and, and mind you, uh, Advanced Gas is a big company. It had 14 vessels at the time. Uh, but uh, Gold Notion, at the time that I uh, uh, moved, had around uh, 60 to 80, I think 67 vessels, I can't remember exactly, plus managing all of John Fredrickson's private fleet uh, and a lot of other vessels. In total, there were 130 vessels in that company. Uh, under control or own. So a huge, 
like step up. It was also listed on NASDAQ, not only in Oslo as advanced. So I had nine months to get used to the, can you say, to advanced gas, and then suddenly doing this again uh, was a pretty, uh, what can you say, uh, terrifying. Uh, but uh, I did it, and uh, it was, as you say, in the midst of COVID, which uh, of course made communication so much more uh, difficult. Um, and just to make matters worse, when I started, after three weeks, the CFO, uh, who uh, had been there for many, many years and was a really good uh, CFO, he said, I'd like to quit. Uh, not because of you, but because of uh, private reasons. So uh, that left me there with uh, no knowledge of dry cargo, no CFO in the middle of COVID. And I'm not going to lie, when I said that was one afternoon, I was thinking, this time, Ulrich, <laughs> this time, <laughs> you, 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 you shot over the goal. Uh, but actually, magically, what happened again, things started to fall into place. We got, you know, slowly but steadily, you start eating into things, change the CFO, change the CCO, uh, reorganize, started to kick out some, you know, started forming your own ideas of what it is that you want to do, make a plan, give it to the board, get a thumbs up, start executing on it. And then slowly but steadily, things uh, things start to uh, start to work. But, but I'm not going to lie, this was a was a tremendous, I mean, it was two tremendous steps of in a very short time uh, that uh, that I had to uh, somehow, uh, what can you say, uh, cope with. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it worked out quite okay. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of uh, what has happened in the in Golden Ocean in my time. So, so I think it worked, but, but, uh, but it, you know, it, it was, uh, it was, it was tough times, um, uh, certainly in the beginning. I mean, and you had substantial impact within your role. So you increased the operational safety, you increased the vessel numbers by 34, if I'm not mistaken. And the company yeah. paid out 900 million in dividends. So you showed interest in paying back your shareholders, basically, and their loyalty. Uh, so... Yeah, it was, it was a pretty accelerating ride. Uh, once uh, you land on your feet, it takes a little time. As I say, you got to make a plan. And we executed very, uh, can you say, diligent on that plan. And I can't, as CEO, take all the credit for that. I mean, it's a it's an effort done by the CFO, the CCO, the board itself, and John. Uh, you work together on all of this. But but as a CEO, you gotta take at least in the Fredrickson system, gotta take the initiative. You gotta say, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is the direction, uh, and then start uh, start getting 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 shit done, so to say. It's part of my French. Uh, I was then also blessed with. Can you say the fact that the markets they became very strong, not very long after I uh, I began. I mean, there was another stress factor was that my my CFO started by saying in two months we're going to break covenants. Break covenants means that you that you are you don't have enough cash in your in the in the bank uh, uh, because you have a loan facility and the banks want a certain amount of cash. And he said we're going to go below that cash. It means that the banks can actually you know they can uh, they can um, they can discontinue the loans. It'll be really big trouble, and I'm like, oh my god, what, what what's going on here? And then the markets turned, money started rolling in, and we could build a strategy around that. So again, you know, a combination of uh, of various factors, luck, coincidence, certainly being one of them, um, and that gave what can you say that that tailwind gave the opportunity to execute on the strategy, which was very much a can you say decarbonization strategy and digitalization strategy, where we wanted to bring down the average age of the vessels. Uh, buy new modern vessels that are better equipped to tackle, can you say, future requirements from from regulators and from and from from customers, um, and uh, can you say, build the 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 the, the position, uh, become, build the company uh, uh, larger. So we, we bought thirty four vessels, but we also sold fourteen old vessels in the in the time. And as you say, yeah, we paid out nine hundred million uh, dividends over two years. Uh, it was a uh, it was good times uh, in, 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 in dry cargo those years. I believe I can sum your entire journey in three words, like in two words, mastering terror. As you said, I, I, I believe it's a very good analogy to sum up your, your journey because you are still and you are extremely young when you undertook these senior positions. Let's not forget about that. And age comes hand in hand with experience. And you technically had lack of it compared to other candidates, but you still perform outstandingly, as I can see. So, uh, Mr. Anderson, what can I say? I want to thank you for doing this. It's an ocean of knowledge, especially for a young girl like me, 
who wants to to enter the maritime sector. I've had big love. I come from Greece, and yeah. I can I can see it's the the only way the only way that I can uh, shine in my country go into the maritime sector. So I I will absolutely use your advice. And attitude is the first one I will keep in my heart. Attitude, have a good attitude. It, I it think that's a. But I mean, you already proven that you have the right attitude by uh, by uh, by uh, starting this. Uh, uh, it's a podcast or this. Uh, <laughs> I hope uh, so. This interview. So I think that that would that, that that's already a big plus, and uh, and clearly the the shipping industry in Greece is 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 is, is huge. Um, so uh, there will be plenty of opportunity uh, for you, I'm sure. Uh, so good luck, uh, good luck with Thank that. You. Um, Thank you. I am, uh, I'm confident we uh, we shall see you in uh, in trade wins eventually. <laughs> I, I will not forget about that. I will, I will promise you that. <laughs> when are you graduating? Uh, so basically, I just graduated in the 27th of July from Brighton University with a degree okay. in mechanical uh, engineering. And I closed on a contract with Rolls Royce Defense Aerospace in Bristol for the graduate scheme. Okay, uh, good. It's it's a it's a very good way because I will uh, it's a, it's a very good uh, scheme because I will be able to be exposed in a lot of industries. So I will have four different internships in one, in yeah. four separate uh, departments of my choice. So I was thinking of like maybe going into nuclear submarines and then basically men together shipping with engineering and then smoothly transition into the maritime sector. Uh, but but the, I think it's a very my... good start to have a. I didn't say this, uh, but I think it's a very good start to have an internship, a graduate program, call it whatever you like. Uh, something where you don't uh, get, uh, can you say, fixed into a eight to oh, four yes. position somewhere that it can be hard to get out of. And 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 this is exactly my point that then you get to see a number of different areas and find out where you uh, you know where where do I feel you know, best uh, at home, so to say, where, where, where mm -hmm. am I on the right shelf? So uh, that would be a good, uh, I think it's a good investment to take a breather, even if it can be tempting to take something, maybe even make a bit more money uh, somewhere. But I think taking a couple of years where you just, you know, learn, still learn. I think that's a very, uh, very smart, uh, smart way of doing it. That was actually the only thing I wanted when I graduated was to find a commercial graduate program, whether it was Maersk or Novo, I also applied for and other Carlsberg. Uh, it happened to be, can you say, uh, uh, Maersk? That was random, but uh, mm -hmm. but the fact that you get this uh, easing in, uh, but still being kind of a talent, which means there's some attention around the uh, around the, the program, surely. So that sounds like a good plan. So you're moving then to Bristol, I suppose. Yes, I will be moving to to Bristol this uh, this winter, yeah. and then my intentions are when I, when I finish the scheme, it lasts two years, by the way. So when I, when I finish that, I want to uh, transition into the maritime sector. It doesn't matter yeah. if it's going to be in, in Greece or elsewise. I just want to be in Europe. I don't want to travel to America. But if it happens, yeah. I don't know. It happens. Oh, yeah. Ah, but the likelihood that uh, well, I mean, there is shipping in America, but it's it's yeah, it's, it's probably more here in Europe or Singapore, maybe. Uh, it's also a big hub, of course, but it's good that you get, uh, can you say, um, uh, experience from uh, from living abroad, which is a huge thing as well, which we didn't talk about, but but something that uh, that uh, that I, I I I can see as well uh, because I lived in I lived in Rio on the first program, and then I was in Washington D.C. in uh, the U.S. between my bachelor and masters, and then of course Hamburg, London, Oslo. Copenhagen, the entire world, basically. It was my hometown, <laughs> but it really, like, it really gives you something to live. Out. Even if some of them were just for like, you know, a year or something, it's still a huge thing to live. Uh, to live, uh, what can you say, away from uh, from your home country? Oh yes. So I think that would be a very uh, big, uh, big plus. But I'm sure you'll do uh, excellently, uh, and uh, that you will, um, you will have a great career in shipping if that's what you like, what you what you still want after two years. Let's see, maybe you. Uh, <laughs> Maybe you want to do something else, but I can recommend the industry. It's a really nice uh, industry. I think the most, what has been the most frustrating for me is, and that's that's what I learned in L'Oreal, where you have the possibility of differentiating your product, right? I mean, essentially, mm -hmm. they could take the same shampoo and put it in different bottles uh, with different design, put them in different distribution channels and charge different prices, okay? <laughs> in shipping, uh, you know, red or blue in the ship, can it sell my cargo? Yeah, what's the cheapest? Okay, fine. So you get like a zero differentiation, you get perfect competition. 
which uh, means that uh, yeah, of course, you're so much in the hands of the markets and how they how they develop. How, how how what are the other owners doing? Are they also building a lot of vessels? Even a good market can turn to bad. And I think that's a bit the frustrating part about shipping. Okay, you can optimize around your business model, and I can talk about that for a long time. So there's a lot of handles you can pull, but at the end of the day. Uh, you are long shipping, you have many ships, and if the markets are poor, you can't make money, no matter how clever you are, no matter how good you are. If there are too many ships, the rates will drop. Whereas if you are in a tech company or in a pharmaceutical company or in L'Oreal for that matter, you can uh, actually make better products, you can have bigger marketing, you can do some stuff to actually, can you say, tweak around things. Whereas in shipping, there's not so much you can do with the product itself, only all the things around it. Uh, so yeah, that's a but that's a separate discussion, but very interesting discussion. But the industry, fantastic people, international and and uh, yeah, I'm I'm, uh, I'm 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 not gonna leave. Let's put it that way. I have no regrets. I, <laughs> I didn't think I was gonna stay forever in in shipping when I started in Maersk. I thought, okay, I do these two years and then maybe I go do something else. But I fell in love with the industry, so you know, I'm staying. But but um, but yeah, that's the only thing that I wish we could you know we could do more. Albeit that is changing because we now have the green transition coming, which means that we have to get the vessels to zero emission and nuclear will probably be one of uh, the future technologies, albeit mm -hmm. five years out minimum, maybe more. Um, so everyone has to transition. So there will be a huge change of the, of the industry. And I mean, that will make a lot of room for people who can understand uh, the new uh, the new world and for companies that can actually can you say monetize uh, that transition who can you know tap into those revenues from from that green transition so the industry will become more differentiated going forward there will be more can you say ways of getting to zero emission you can you can do a lot of stuff and I think that will that will that will lead to some positive changes for shipping uh, but for those who are old fashioned and uh, old thinking. It will be that death, uh, just like you see in the tech industry or uh, you know uh, elsewhere where innovation is running much faster. So that that so you're coming into the shipping, I think industry you will time it pretty well in a, 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 an hour. I think it be you know I think it will be good years lying ahead for generally speaking for shipping over the next ten you know fifteen years while we do this transition. But anyways, I, yeah, I re I really oh, I no. sincerely do hope so because the owners are very open minded. So I, I sincerely do hope so, at least in some Greece. Some of them are, so, some of them yes. not so much. But, uh, <laughs> yes. There will always be winners and losers in a transition. Uh, so you just have to uh, st stick to the winners. But um, but you are young, so you get it. Uh, it's more when you have a ship owner who is 75 years old. He could be Greek. He could also mm -hmm. be something else. But yes. they have very difficulties understanding that, uh, you know, what is all this now uh, with this green thing? <laughs> um, oh, yes. And uh, well, that's not how we used to do it. No, exactly. And that's why you need to change it. Um, so, and there are a lot of companies that don't think like that, but there are some companies that are still caught up in the, in the old ways of doing things. But, but my point is that you get, you get an industry that is really finally innovating more, uh, you know, going forward, it will innovate much more than it, uh, than it has done in the past, where it's been a very old, Fashion, very traditional industry, well, very little innovation. Whereas I think that that has already changed. It's speeding up. Okay, we will not become tech industry overnight, but things are certainly moving uh, on a lot of parameters in order to bring down emissions, bring down bunker consumption, things that people didn't think about before. Uh, and that's positive, uh, let alone regulation, right? I mean, we're going to have a carbon tax in Europe uh, from uh, January. I think that will spread. We have a uh, finance that is now being uh, tied. You know, you get cheaper finance if you have low emitting vessels. And so the whole business model is changing. It's very interesting. Anyways, I uh, could talk about that for hours, uh, but uh, I, I could keep you here. <laughs> yes, I, <laughs> but, um, I could keep you good, here for hours. <laughs> good, good, good luck uh, with everything. Thank you. And then, uh, yeah, I hope you uh, can use what we have done today. Absolutely, Mr. Anderson. Thank you for your time. It really means a lot. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and uh, good luck. And uh, I'll uh, I'll follow you. Uh, I'll follow you on uh, on LinkedIn and see where you go. Thank you. It's okay. gonna be the same from my side. Wishing you all the best. All Have right. A beautiful thank day. you so much. Thank you. Good thank luck you. to you. All Bye. The best.